Any other announcements? No. Um, at this time, we're going to invite uh, video Pastor Paul <laughs> to deliver a message for us. So, Pastor Paul. Um, we just didn't feel that it was safe for me to come and, and be able to speak with you this morning. At any rate, you've probably heard that as of yesterday, which was Wednesday, four of my six family members have COVID. And um, I just suspect by the end of the week that it's going to find its way to me. So anyway, that's why I am recording for you this morning. But thank you for being here. I'm sorry that I can't join with you uh, this morning, but I wanted to come and bring you the message on the uh, video anyway, instead of canceling church, right? So anyway, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, love like you've never loved before. And, uh, you know, coming up, this is just a reminder, gentlemen, in just a few days, it is going to be Valentine's Day. And uh, it's the season of hearts, and it's the season of chocolates, and you have just exactly three days, guys, to find a suitable gift that expresses your undying love. So don't mess it up. Uh, no pressure, right? Well, speaking of love, let's take a look this morning at a love that transcends uh, fleeting romances or fleeting feelings or even sugary treats that we all love. And it's a love that ignites your soul and transforms other relationships. So regardless if your plans for this week, Wednesday, Wednesday, gentlemen, regardless of what your plans are, whether it's a, uh, a beautiful bouquet of flowers, or whether it's dinner out, or maybe it is chocolates, or um, a romantic dinner, you know, a can of SpaghettiOs, or uh, maybe bologna and cheese. <laughs> Nothing wrong with bologna as long as it's fried. But anyway, a bologna and cheese sandwich, there's just an excitement that surrounds Valentine's Day. And that excitement can be measured in dollars. In 2022, the excitement of Valentine's Day translated into 23.9 billion, with a B, dollars. That was in 2022. In 2023, the excitement of Valentine's Day jumped to 25.9 billion dollars. People spend a lot of money trying to buy love. But what if true love was deeper and more radical, more meaningful than anything that Hallmark could sell? This morning, I want to talk to you about that. We're going to, we're going to jump back to Matthew 5, and we're going to finish up that chapter. You remember, we have been talking about um, the Beatitudes. We've been with Jesus and his disciples. They've been sitting up on the northern slope of the Sea of Galilee, and they're overlooking the sea. And remember, Jesus sat down, and he is teaching these people. And Jesus has been teaching what is expected from people that are a part of his kingdom. And he says in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 43, 43 through 48. And he says here, he says in verse 43, he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil one and on the good and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward do you have do not even the tax collectors do the same and if you greet only your brothers what more are you doing than others do not even the gentiles do the same and verse 48 is very scary to a lot of people he says you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect now jesus is teaching here and his uh teaching moves beyond just fleeting sentiments to a deeper and more transformative love and what he is saying is so counterintuitive because he calls on people to love their enemies now i want to tell you the world has a definition and an expectation of what love looks like you might ask a young man what he wants in the woman that he wishes to love for the rest of his life. And if you were to ask him that, you may get answers like, well, she has to look a certain way. She has to perform her various duties in a certain way. She must like sports and cars or hiking or whatever it is. You fill in the blank just like I do. She must want what I want. She must be supportive of me. She must make me feel a certain way. And the list can go on and on. And on the one hand, I guess I would say bravo and congratulations to you, young man, for knowing what you want and what you are looking for in life and in a spouse. But I'd like to say good luck on finding that mermaid that's riding a unicorn that you're looking for because she doesn't exist. You see, here's the deal. Whenever you start laying down criteria like that, where you are actually saying, what you're actually saying is that your love is dependent on something that you can get in return. And what you've done is you've made your love that you give to someone transactional. You've made it conditional. You know, the other thing is that society has taught us a truly false definition of what love really is. Society has taught us that love is primarily romantic. Love is based on feelings. Love is emotional. And love is conditional. And all of this is in direct contrast to what our Lord calls for us. He says that love is unconditional love. He, he calls us to extend love even to those who oppose us. Love is not an affectionate feeling, but it's a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. You know who said that? C.S. Lewis, the guy that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Love is not an affectionate feeling but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. You see, Christ gives a revolutionary call for us to love our enemies in verse 43 and 44. And that had to sound like crazy talk back then because for generations it had been taught by the priest in the synagogue to love their neighbors and to hate their enemies. And the Greek expression here that Jesus uses is the Greek word agapao. And agapao may sound familiar. It's where we get our word that we're familiar with called agape. Agape. And when agapao is used in scripture regarding and referring to God toward mankind, it expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards an entirely unworthy object or person. That's me. That's you. Agapao from God 
toward man produces this reverential love in us towards him who is the giver of such love. And he gives that love to an unlovable person. Agapao is also a practical love towards those who are partakers in this same, of this same, and, and it builds in us a desire to seek back the giver of that love. You see, what Jesus is actually saying is that he's saying to agape across boundaries. He's saying that we should agape across boundaries and borders that we have established in our hearts and our minds toward others. And some of those boundaries and enemies, they, they can look like different things. They can look like personal conflicts. I know you've never had a personal conflict with anyone. It can, it can be something as simple as an ideological difference. Who you vote for. Who you support. What your thoughts are about a particular, um, uh, a particular hot-button issue in our society. It can be social divisions. Well, we don't want to live next to them. We don't want to be part of that community. We build up these boundaries and we build up these borders in our mind. But sometimes it means loving those who hurt us or criticize us openly. Or maybe they even oppose us to our face. And that's hard. In church, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I understood the mystery of how all of this works, but somehow Christ's love can bridge the gap. It can. It, it can it can bridge the, the gap in your family. It can bridge the gap in the conflict of the workplace tension or the disputes in our community. When I think about loving our enemies, you know, a fairly contemporary example that I always think of is Dr. Martin Luther King. And he was, he tries to get between his followers who are, are enraged and they want to resort to violence, even though they had been the subject of violence. And what he says one time is just profound. It's marked me for, for the rest of my life. But he says this. He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And what I'd like to say to you is that the love of Christ can overcome any situation. Amen? You know, if we can ever get our hearts in a position where we see others the way that he sees others, we will be able to extend that compassion even when it's hard. And then he goes on in verse 44, and he says, pray for your enemies. And what I'd like to tell you is that prayer for your enemies does more than what you realize. You know, several years ago, I remember that there was a challenge that came through the church. You, know, you get all these different types of challenges but it was called the 30 day challenge. And I think that it had great merit to it. And the idea was for you to conjure up in your mind, the person that you just could not stand. <laughs> you thinking of them right now? You know, that person that you hoped would go home and find their dog dead. The person that you hoped would have four flat tires on their way to church or on their way to work in a rainstorm. You get my point. And the challenge was that you would think of that person and then spend the next 30 days praying for them, really praying for them. And I don't mean prayers like what David prayed in Psalm 69. This is what we call an imprecatory prayer but where he says about his enemies to God. Listen to what David says. He says, may the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. 
Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents, for they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Wow. That's a harsh prayer. Now, that's not what I'm talking about on this 30-day challenge. The 30-day challenge was for you to genuinely pray for God's best to overtake that person that you did not like or couldn't stand. And then at the end of that 30 days, come back and discuss how you feel about that person now after you've spent 30 days praying for them. And I guarantee you that your views and your feelings about how that person is or what you think about that person would be drastically different after 30 days. Prayer changes situations, but prayer is not just about changing others. It's also about transforming our hearts. Somehow, our feelings follow our actions. Now, over the last 20 years, there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of attention given to the book by Dr. Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. Have you ever heard of it? I think it's a great book for couples. Kara and I have gone through that book several times. We've gone through that book as we sat in a class with other couples um, and, and worked on our marriage in a class. But then there have been times where we were the ones that were teaching classes. And we, we had a, a room full of couples and we were teaching and we used that book. And the premise of this book is that every person alive has a love language that falls into one of these five categories. These categories are acts of service, quality time, words of affirmation, physical touch, and receiving gifts. And it's the job of the couple during the time that they read this book to determine what love language their spouse speaks. Because so many people try to connect and uh, 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 talk with their spouse and communicate with their spouse in a language that they don't like, right? So, for instance, her love language, according to this book, would say something like, her love language is quality time, but maybe his love language is physical touch. So he goes around trying to talk to her in his love language. Or maybe her quality time, or her, her love language is quality time, but his love language is buying gifts, and he keeps buying her gifts because he thinks that's her love language. Well... You can see how that's a problem, but I don't have time to get into it this morning, but what I would like to propose is that there's a sixth love language, and Jesus talks about it. Prayer is also a love language. Intercessory prayer, where individuals pray on the behalf of others, it exemplifies an empathy and compassion like what Jesus had. If you were to go back in, into, to, uh, I guess we're in Matthew, so if you were to fast forward to John chapter 17, Jesus is with his disciples and he prays something that theologians call his high priestly prayer. And he prays for his disciples and he also prays for people that become disciples because of those disciples. So he's actually praying for us. But Jesus prays for all prayers, and or all believers, and this is called intercessory prayer, and it reflects a selfless concern for the well-being of others. And whenever we do this, it embodies the love and the empathy that characterized all of Christ's ministry. So what I'd like to tell you is don't be surprised when you notice a change in your own life when you truly commit and you pray for that hard person or that hard case in your life. 
it may not be the change that you expected because you may be the one that changes. I've seen it happen over and over. And then in verse 45, it talks about reflecting God's love. When we look at God's love, we know that God's love is unconditional. His love is a love that extends to all, regardless of their merit, regardless of their worth. And Jesus challenges those that are sitting there that when you love those hard-to-love people, you are actually reflecting God's love. And he says that God gives his son, and I like how it's phrased there. It doesn't say the son. It says his son, not his son like S-O-N, but his S-U-N. It says that God gives his son to rise on the God hater. He he does he 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 causes his son to rise on the God hater just as much as he does on the most righteous person that was walking the earth. Just because a person might be an enemy of God doesn't mean that God is going to withhold the rain from them. They're not going to be in drought. Now, I have a feeling that if that was left up and those kinds of choices were made by humans, <laughs> by mankind, that the person that we couldn't stand, the person that we did not like, the person that was the hard case scenario, the person that's so embraceive that you don't want to spend time with, the person that you don't even want to pray for, if the choices were left up to us, how to treat them like God says here, our enemies would likely see no sunlight, they would see no water, and they would live in drought. That's just how we are at times. And then I'd like to tell you in verses 46 and 47 that love exceeds expectation. And if you remember, Jesus was talking earlier, because we did this just a, a month or two back. We were studying through Matthew 5, and he talks about going the extra mile. You remember that? And according to Jesus' words here, it would seem that the norm of the culture of that day was to love those who could love you back. And you would greet and welcome those who you already knew those who you were already close to, those who you were comfortable with, and you wouldn't go out of your way to um, welcome anyone. And Jesus says something here that is profound. Really, it's insulting. He says to the people sitting around him, he says that if that's what you do, you're no different than a tax collector. You're no different than the pagans. And those were fighting words. You know, Jesus could have looked at those people and he could have compared the people to being a prostitute. He could have uh, looked at the people and said, you, you would be no better than a, a bum living under a bridge. And it wouldn't have cut them near as deeply as saying a tax collector. You see, tax collectors were hated by everyone. The tax collector was the worst insult that Jesus could have used. Tax collectors were traitors. They took money from everybody. They taxed their fellow citizens. They taxed the other people. They, they taxed everybody. They were considered traitors. They were greedy. They overtaxed. They were thieves. They stole from everybody. There, there was no honor. There was no loyalty in a tax collector. And let me remind you again, Jesus is speaking to this gathering around him who are a part of his kingdom. And he tells them in verse 40, uh, what is this, verse 46, 47? He tells them, I expect more than that of you. 
The bar has been raised. I expect more. Now, why would why why should more be expected from a Christian than others? Well, Christians claim to have something that the others don't have. Jesus. A Christian is renewed. They're a redeemed people by Jesus. Christians have a power that the others do not have. The Holy Spirit. Christians can do all things. Jesus promised. He said they can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And like I mentioned, Christians have the Spirit of God living in them. And not only that, Christians have a better future than the others do. God expects more from people who are his than the people who are not his. And then as we move on toward the end, verse 48, did he say we have to be perfect? And how do I do that? You know, a lot of people who read this may get to verse 48 and throw their hands up and say, it's impossible. What is the point? I can't even do that. And what I'd like to point out to you this morning is that the translators use the word perfect, but this is actually a Greek word, teleos, which also means completeness to be full grown, to be mature. And this doesn't necessarily imply being flawless, but rather to have a continuous journey of growth, a continuous journey that brings maturity into our lives, a continuous journey to embody Christ's love. You see, that perfection it's a journey. It's not a destination. And we think of it as a destination. But what the, the, the thing that we need to realize is it's the journey that matters. What's happening on the right and the left. It's not that thing that we're shooting for. It's what's happening around us at the moment. That's the journey. Learning what he wants you to learn along the way. And as your pastor... I want to encourage you, I highly encourage you to embrace this journey. It's a great journey. Seek the opportunities to learn from the mistakes and grow in your capacity to love. So as we come to a close this morning, you know, Valentine's Day is approaching, but I would like for us to choose a love that transcends this season. May our love be a love that reflects the heart of Christ, a love that transforms not just our lives, but the lives of those around us. You see, he has called us to love like we have never loved before. And through Jesus, we have a perfect and radical example to follow. So let me ask you something this morning as we close. What is God speaking to you today? Jesus gave us quite an assignment, didn't he? That's some heavy homework that he gave us. I want you to think about this. Are there any relationships that even as I've been speaking to you, that the Holy Spirit is shining a spotlight on and he's pointed out to you in your heart. He says, son or daughter, you really need to work on this. You need to pour a whole lot of love into this situation. Are there opportunities that you're beginning to realize that you could love like you've never loved before. Maybe you never even wanted to. So if that's you, 
Let God speak to you this morning. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray for you? And thank you for, um, I know this is a little different this morning, but thank you for being willing to listen. Let's pray. Wonderful Father, we're just a few days away from a holiday that celebrates love, and we confess that our understanding often falls short. Father, we cling to definitions of love that are conditional, they're transactional, they're very limited, God. We love those who only love us back and those who fit our expectations or those who are easy to care for. But Lord, you showed us a different kind of love. You showed us a love that extends beyond boundaries. It extends beyond preferences. It even extended beyond what was deserved. Lord, we just pray for forgiveness. Forgive us for falling short of what you called us to do. Forgive us for the times that we have withheld love from others, for the times that we've let anger and resentment fester in our hearts, and for the times that we've allowed hatred to take root in our lives. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to those that are around us. God, there are many who have hurt us. There are those who have disagreed with us. There are those who are a perpetual challenge to us. But help us to see them not as enemies, but as vessels that are worthy of your love. God, give us courage to take the first step. However that looks, God, whether it's offering kind words, a helping hand, or maybe giving of ourself in some sort of act of service. But God, help us to take that first step to pray for those who are difficult to love, even when it feels so uncomfortable. God, I pray that you would transform our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Break down the walls of prejudice and indifference that fill us with your compassion, with your empathy, with your love that knows no bounds, God. And Father, may we, just like Jesus, love like we've never loved before. God, not for accolades, not for recognition, but simply because you call us to do that. And may our love be a bridge and a testament to your incredible grace that you have given all. There's no higher name that we can call upon and no higher name than we ask than in the name of Jesus, who did love us unconditionally and give himself as a sacrifice for all. Amen. Hey, before we dismiss this morning, I just wanted to, uh, I, I don't know if Sebastian mentioned this earlier, but please come next week. Uh, my dear friend, Dr. Chad Payne is going to be here filling the pulpit, and you're really going to like him. He is a much better preacher than I am. Uh, come, cheer him on. He is a precious man. Um, I love Dr. Chad. Uh, he was a teacher for me. He, he was the professor for one of my classes that I had to go through, and I am thrilled that I was able to get him to come fill the pulpit for me while I'm gone. I am going to be flying out and uh, going to Pittsburgh for a week um, next Sunday, so that's why I won't be here. But again, please don't let that stop you from coming. Come listen to someone else for a Sunday. 